I like the cat riding the unicorn portion. Good morning, everybody. Hopefully that this talk will be able to wake you up a little bit. Uh, it's a very interesting topic for an OWASP uh, conference, and it deals with incident response for a very high-level incident that happened not too far from here back in 2014. So to give you a bit of a background of myself, uh, my actual area of expertise is cyber warfare. And I advise various governments, the EU Parliament, the UK Parliament, and so forth on different types of strategy uh, dealing with technology to both protect and kill people. So it's kind of a fun field for me. <clears throat> and I uh, started out being a little script kitty as a 10-year-old, uh, because I just love to hack things. I don't know why, I just do. So, because this is a no-wasp talk, I wanted to point out some of the main portions of this incident that hit on the various uh, types of the OWASP top 10, both for the web application portion and for the IoT portion, for some of the hardware that was affected. And I think that uh, the various OWASP top tens are a very good way to look at, hey, how can we avoid some very basic to very high level incidents? And this type of incident that I'm about to describe to you could have absolutely been avoided if they had looked at the OWASP top 10. So the way it started out was I used to head the information protection group for a Ramco and the Saudi Ramco family for EMEA in Latin America. And that involved leading the SOC, the NOC, and an international intelligence group. And one day, when I thought that I could actually have a nice lunch, because I didn't eat very much at work, there was always some sort of putting out a fire, a very large man came up to me while I was eating a spinach salad, and I still had spinach stuck in my teeth when he came, and he goes, you need to come with me. And I'm like, uh-oh. Maybe they found out that I've been mining bitcoins on that supercomputer. Uh, hopefully it's not some sort of family emergency. Instead, he goes, uh, no, you need to come with me. And I go, what's going on? He goes, well, I'm not at that level. I don't know. And uh, instead, I was told that there was a major incident at the Royal Saudi Arabian Embassy in The Hague. Now, at first, it started out as something very simple. Unfortunately, it grew to something very, very major and involved most of the embassies of The Hague. Uh, the Dutch National Terrorism Police became involved, local police became involved as well, and the entire diplomatic corps, which is the diplomatic police, which is a separate uh, law enforcement type of agency that they have in many places in the world. Now, one thing to remember is embassies are not a company. They are not your typical type of private entity. They are the sovereign property of a country. So local laws don't apply. And the way you have to deal with the crime that happens at an embassy is completely different than how you would handle it if you are dealing with an incident at a company or even just your regular governmental office. Uh, the, dip, uh, the diplomatic corps has some very limited jurisdiction in all of these matters, and the ambassador is basically the king or queen of that particular embassy and everything that goes on. And they are the ones who have absolute final say if anything moves forward with an outside entity. So there were four major incidents, and I'll talk you through them. Uh, the first one involved and hack into the business back-end email account of the Saudi Arabian Embassy of The Hague. And we found that there was a bit of rootkit malware, and it began with some extortion demands that grew almost exponentially, as did also the physical threats that were posed. Because in the beginning, an email hack just seems like a pretty simple thing. Unfortunately, in this particular case, the people that uh, I was dealing with and we were dealing with were not your run-of-the-mill criminals. So one of the things we found, I was able to take my uh, right-hand forensics person on site at the embassy, is we did some packet captures along the business network, not the government intelligence network, and we found that there was a rootkit installed on the particular network, and we could see it through the packet captures. And 
What's interesting about this is uh, if you are a nation state and you want to use a, uh, a specialized tool, these types of tools cost quite a bit of money, and once you use them, you burn them. And you can also identify, hey, this high-end tool, it wasn't coming from a commercial off-the-shelf. You can buy some malware, so it's got to be a nation state. In this case, the tool that was used was something that you could buy. And what we call this is plausible deniability. So we believe that it was actually planted by the insider, who was a perpetrator, who unbeknownst to him was actually given the malware by the Iranian government. Now, at the same time, we were also having some additional fun with drones. Now, this is a quote uh, I did with uh, the uh, NATO Secretary General on cyber espionage. And if you think about this, the moment that you see a high-end tool, it's burned. And that's one of the reasons why we think that uh, this particular malware was used so that it couldn't be immediately identified to the Iranian government. Now, at the same time, my office up here was right next to the embassy of Yemen. Now, just prior to this particular incident, uh, the Yemens uh, purchased the building that they now have an embassy at with cash. We were not located in the embassy district, and it was quite unusual, and uh, our investigators actually uh, had high suspicions that the Iranian government gave them that money. We also caught uh, the Yemeni embassy staff digging in our backyard, trying to get to our fiber and trying to uh, go ahead and surveil our fiber. We also caught uh, embassy uh, employees inside our building, inside our canteen or our cafeteria. And uh, one day, I'm talking to my boss, and we're on the top floor, and he's got lovely, nice glass behind him, and I suddenly see a drone. Well, it turns out that uh, the Yemeni embassy started to drone surveil us to try to record any sort of conversations and also to watch the ins and outs of what was going on at our office because Aramco is the national oil company of Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia and the Iranians are not friends, and Saudi Arabia and Yemen are not friends either right now with various rebel groups. Earlier this year and also earlier this month, there have been rocket attacks and also bomb-laden drones sent from Yemen by a rebel group that is actually backed by the Iranian government. So drone activity with this particular government or these two governments is not that unusual. Now, because this was happening from an embassy next door, we couldn't actually just contact the police. We had to go through uh, diplomatic means and contact the diplomatic corps to uh, then have them inform that they can fly whatever drone they want over embassy property, but they cannot fly a drone over any other property because it's illegal in the Netherlands, and that's where their sovereign property ends is on their property line. So there were certain reasons why I was chosen for this task. Uh, one of them was I was already working for the Aramco family at a fairly high level, and I had a security team and a very good security background. Uh, another reason was uh, on a fairly frequent basis uh, for a number of years, I've been able to talk tech and change that around for management speak, executive speak, and also I deal with a lot of ministers and ambassadors on a fairly regular basis. So uh, they do not understand what a packet capture is. You will completely lose them, and they will wonder why you were even invited into the room if you mention those words or try to show them something like that. So you have to speak to them in a completely different way using their particular lingo. That's just the way it goes. Uh, I also have a background with law enforcement, and not, not just on the bad, naughty side when I was busted as a kid, but also dealing with law enforcement because I've dealt with a lot of various cybercrime issues. And uh, lastly, at the time, uh, there's a right-wing politician I'm sure all of the Dutch people here are familiar with. His name is Hurt Wilders, and he had made some videos which were quite offensive to the Muslim world, and it basically royally pissed off the Saudis to the point where they consoled a whole bunch of contracts for Dutch companies and kicked a lot of Dutch people out of Saudi Arabia because of it. So there was a problem with geopolitics already going on. Now, I 
stress, my uh, forensics person came to me on day one, with me, I should say, but because he was Dutch, he could no longer come back to the embassy. Only I could because of my citizenship. <clears throat> so how it started, it seemed like a, a pretty simple thing. What's going on? Well, our email was hacked. Okay. Well, what was the password? One, two, three, four, five, six. I go, I excuse me? This is, this is an embassy. Uh, can you tell me that again? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. That was actually not what I was expecting. And it also turned out that they were using a residential ISP, uh, with a residential modem that had also never been updated. Yay. Perfect for an embassy. And to complicate matters more, uh, the person who was the IT person, it was his very first week, and there was no handover from the other guy, and we could not get in touch with the other guy at all. We had no idea where he was in the world. He said, yay, I'm out of the embassy, I'm on vacation, goodbye. So the new guy uh, had a lot of pressure on him because of everything that was going on. And it began with uh, an interesting thing. Uh, the Saudi Arabian embassy no longer uh, handles visa applications. They have a third party. And so there was an email sent asking, hey, can you uh, help me with my visa from a Saudi national? And then it became a bit unusual because of the uh, method of communicating, if you send me 200 euros, I'll expedite that for you, and you send it to MoneyGram. How many people here think that that MoneyGram is a valid place? Nobody, right. And uh, also uh, with the email chain that uh, the hacker started, uh, the hacker started making it a bit uh, personal and tried to defame uh, the reputation of the then uh, Saudi Arabian ambassador to the United Kingdom. So <clears throat> this is what it looked like. And uh, say, hey, you, you, you send my money over and I will expedite everything. And to make matters a little uh, more inconvenient, uh, the person who said it, sent it, a Dr. Samaya Al Saouf, is a bit of a controversial figure from the United Kingdom. And it was at the point when there was a mention of MoneyGram that uh, she contacted the ambassador directly and said, hey, I think there's something going on with your secretary. Because the secretary to the ambassador was the only person that was supposed to be allowed to handle any sort of embassy email at this level. And she's highly trusted and a very, very lovely person. So that started uh, the suspicion. So we did what you would usually do for a basic incident. We're like, hey, let's change the password. Let's look at your equipment. Let's do everything like that, and let's lock you down. All right, fine. Then a week later, I'm trying to eat lunch again, and the same very large man in a very nice suit comes up to me and goes, I've come here to summon you again. And I'm like, I'm never going to eat lunch. I am never going to eat lunch as long as I work here. Unfortunately, uh, because of my citizenship, I had limited access to all of their systems. And most embassies, many embassies, not all embassies, um, ha are also an intelligence function. And this is very much the same with the Saudi Arabian embassy. And uh, I had to be limited to what I could actually look at. So I could only look at the business portion, not the intelligence network portion, which is fine. Um, unfortunately, though, with the limited amount of access, I couldn't see everything everything that was going on. So it turns out that the attacker was still in the system. And although we had done all sorts of different changes, the persistent little was still in there. And at this time, the amount of money started going up. And instead of being, hey, we'll expedite your visa, there was instead an email sent to certain Middle Eastern countries in the country of Turkey asking for 25,000 euro. So uh, it was a, a friendly email, which is the best way to describe it. It was also signed um, Friends of ISIS, and it came from the Royal Saudi Arabian business email address to the other embassies. Now, this obviously is not a good thing if you're an embassy and someone is saying that uh, other embassies need to pay 25K to save many lives. Friends of ISIS. 
And um, this was starting to affect the back channel uh, reputation of the Saudi Arabian embassy at this point. Uh, luckily, there were a couple of countries that were uh, very cooperative and allowed me to uh, take samples of their data to see if there was any difference in the emails, the headers, uh, how many hops, all sorts of different things. Because only using one sample... Uh, it's much easier to look at all the evidence. And so two countries were very cooperative. Uh, and I'm very thankful for that because it helped in the long run. And this is actually what the email looked like. And they were, they were nice enough to uh, actually sign it, ISIS, as well. I mean, obviously this is uh, sanitized, but uh, yes. So this was not a good thing coming from, of all countries, the embassy of Saudi Arabia. So, uh, the diplomatic corps, they were trying to be very proactive. And I uh, really enjoyed working with them, but they made one key mistake, which I think a lot of us have made before. I myself have made this particular mistake before. Using CC instead of BCC, right? So, the diplomatic police are like, hey, all the embassies of the Hague and your official back channel emails. Listen, we've been hearing about these extortion attempts for 25K. If you happen to get any of them, go ahead and forward them to us and we'll see if we can help, right? It was really helpful, except it was CC. And the attacker was still on the back end of the system at this time. So it exposed all of the email addresses for all of the embassies in The Hague and uh, the perpetrators replied back to everyone and said, hey, glad we have your attention now. We're going to start putting the money up. Thank you so much, Diplomatic Corps. We're enjoying this. And they began to taunt the Diplomatic uh, Corps back and forth, carbon copy all of the embassies in The Hague, right? So this is where things started getting real interesting. Um, <clears throat> and, and this was not a good thing because a lot of the other embassies, you either have a friendly relationship, a strained relationship, or I hate you. And this is just the way it, it works. There's a great book uh, about uh, some of the relationships between various countries, and it's called uh, Governments That Hate Me. And it explains in depth uh, why certain governments uh, do not work together whatsoever. But uh, this also uh, began a big problem because uh, several of the embassies are like, uh, we're, we're, we're getting kind of scared because ISIS is involved. And ISIS sometimes kills people instead of just extorting them. So and in the background, uh, we were able to keep it quiet in the press. And this is where the uh, Dutch terrorism police at a national level began to get involved. And they began uh, rolling out uh, plainclothes security around uh, the embassy section of The Hague and other uh, stretched uh, other embassies that aren't in the area, like the Irish embassy, for example, is right next to the beach of Schrevenen, which I completely butchered that name, but that's okay. So uh, the security started being quietly heightened all throughout The Hague because of this. Now, <clears throat> the perpetrator decided to make it even more personal after the taunting of the diplomatic police and the rest of the embassies. And the perpetrator actually broke into the secretary to the ambassador's personal Gmail account and began sending uh, physical threats as well as upping the amount of extortion that they wanted. Uh, this obviously scared the secretary to the point where she contacted the local police uh, to file various police reports. Unfortunately, um, she tried to file three times, but we had to quash those particular uh, police reports uh, due to uh, the entire uh, situation. And the Dutch local police were very cooperative at the time. However, they did uh, try to uh, make sure that they were watching out for her because she liked to go jogging and things like that. So we tried uh, our best to make her feel safe as much as possible. So uh, the, we'll say, signed ISIS perpetrator uh, then started saying, hey, I want $35 million U.S. dollars and various you know, currency and gold and so forth, or bad things are going to happen. 
Now, the perpetrator finally uh, threatened a maximum of 50 million, or we're going to blow up the Kerr House. Now, the Kerr House is a national landmark on, I'll try to say it correctly, Schrevening, uh, which is a beach uh, off the Hague. And this is where the uh, rich and famous wealthy people would stay before they went on their cruises, before uh, airplanes were big. And uh, a lot of people go there. It's a tourist attraction on the beach. It's a lovely place. Uh, however, uh, there had been a national Saudi Day celebration that was planned for the Kerr House. And when uh, a country does a national celebration, then there's usually lots of dignitary. There was some Dutch royalty uh, invited. You had the ambassador from the U.S., the ambassador from the U.K., ambassador from Japan, so on and so forth, which were all invited dignitaries. So these are VVVVVIP uh, folks who have a lot of pool uh, in the rest of the world. And the final big threat was, if you do not pay me 50 million U.S. dollars by this date, we will blow up the Kerr house and kill everybody in it. Now, obviously, uh, when a national landmark and such a public area is threatened, uh, this heightened security even more uh, in the Hague area. And we were still able to keep it kind of quiet, uh, while at the same time, lots of security was around uh, the city, both public and private. And we began to get around the Saudi Arabian embassy uh, armed, uh, fully armed, with rifles and so forth, uh, police presence around our embassy and our office, as well as a few other key embassies uh, that had also been originally threatened. And this is, was uh, not a, uh, hmm, a very nice thing because although our Dutch police are armed, you're just not used to seeing such a presence around. Now here's where it got very, very strange, and it took a very weird twist. So as we're dealing with uh, the perpetrator giving us a lot of threats and I'm trying to negotiate with the perpetrator, um, I used to go out to this pub, which was right around my house in The Hague, called Sherlock's, which was voted the best British pub in the Netherlands, of all things. And uh, I come in one evening, because this is stressful, so I kind of like a beer or two. And uh, the owner, happened to be the bartender that evening, goes, these three gentlemen have been waiting for you. And they've been sitting there for two to three hours just sipping tea because they did not drink alcohol. And it turns out they were all cultural attaches assigned to the Turkish embassy. Well, this is interesting. I'm not Turkish. I've been to Turkey a few times, but okay. And they go, well, we've been waiting for you to give us English lessons. We wanted to ask you if you would give us English lessons but you speak English. I don't understand. Why would you ask me? Uh, so this was kind of strange. I, I kind of like to refer to them as the dumb, dumber, and dumbest uh, intel agents I've ever run into, unfortunately. Uh, but there were certain reasons why they were kind of assigned to me. Uh, one of the reasons why there are so many journalists that are arrested in Turkey and sometimes disappeared was when they tried to report on some of the illicit activities involving Erdogan's son, who uh, it's kind of well known uh, in certain circles, especially diplomatic circles, that a lot of the uh, ISIS oil, uh, big caravans come from Syria, come through Turkey, and then suddenly it's sold, and Erdogan's son makes a lot of money, as well as his friends. So there were certain vested interests in keeping an eye on me. And it was at this time that the security services also informed me that they had found a list, uh, an ISIS a uh, high profile or high t uh, target uh, kidnap list. And I was number two on that list because I guess they wanted to kidnap me and uh, hold me for ransom. So I was assigned, I, I don't like close protection uh, personally. Like I don't want uh, close protection uh, bodyguards in my house. 
that, that, that kind of puts a damper on things. But uh, I was assigned uh, distant protection to keep an eye on me and also any time, especially that I met with these three Turkish agents. And everything that I discussed with them had to be reported back. And uh, every evening uh, for about two and a half weeks, I had to engage with these particular Turkish agents. Now, towards the end of the two and a half weeks, uh, one of them, the more senior, gave me a very unusual gift. Uh, I am not Muslim, and obviously I'm a woman, and he gave me uh, something that is not typical for someone you don't know very well, and he gave me these beautiful prayer beads from fine wood, which was very nice, and I immediately handed it over to security services to check for bugs. Because sometimes gifts are more than a gift. I think we all remember the story of the Trojan horse, right? So uh, suddenly, uh, after about two and a half weeks, uh, they disappeared. They were no longer waiting for me for hours for me to get off work drinking tea at a pub. And uh, it turns out uh, I was informed that all three of them uh, actually left the country all at the same time and went back to Turkey. So there were no more uh, very odd, kind of slightly creepy uh, Turkish intel agents uh, asking me for English lessons. Now, <clears throat> we started to suspect because of the personal nature of the attack and also going after the ambassador's secretary's personal email account that this could actually be an insider. It was actually the ambassador who first uh, suggested it because he suspected two people but one person in particular for various reasons. And uh, one evening after all the rest of the staff left, it was just me, the ambassador, and his bodyguards. And the ambassador was so eager uh, because of the various threats to try to figure out if this insider was an insider, he started getting down on his hands and knees, reaching underneath desks, looking for post-it notes for credentials so that we could get into that person's account without them knowing. And I'd never, and I don't think I'll ever see this again in my life, uh, an ambassador just getting amongst the dust and doing the same kinds of things that most of us do on a fairly regular basis. So it was quite an unusual thing. And... Um, we began to trace some of the various messages that were coming from uh, different places that the perpetrator was sending and uh, starting to build a profile on this particular individual. And as it got closer and closer, uh, I was able to take embassy property home with me, uh, which is quite unusual, so I was very trusted. And after about 15 minutes and a half a glass of wine, I figured out that uh, the attacker was still on the back end with an email forwarder. And we were able to get the attacker out, and some additional emails were sent from a Yandex account. We tried to use diplomatic means to uh, go through the various hops to get additional information and evidence, and we were finally able to pinpoint uh, the perpetrator in one particular uh, neighborhood, a close neighborhood in The Hague, and that's where the main suspect actually lived. So uh, the ambassador's suspicions were most likely correct, um, and uh, that particular individual was also from a, we'll say, a, a powerful family back in Saudi, and you can't just uh, fire an individual like that. So instead, uh, after we paid, and I do want to stress, no ransom was ever, or excuse me, extortion was ever paid, uh, but uh, the person had to be taken care of in a different way. So this particular individual was reassigned to an extremely uh, physically dangerous location in the world, and unfortunately, within a couple of weeks of his new assignment, he was uh, the only person uh, killed in a particular car bomb in this particular country. So modern problems require modern solutions. That's all I can say. <clears throat> now... Because of this, um, and because of the work I did, uh, and also my forensics person did, I got a few cool rewards, uh, which is kind of nice because it was very stressful. It actually lasted for about two and a half months, the entire incident. That's a long time for an incident to last. Uh, I was uh, invited to this uh, posh private dinner 
uh, by the ambassador as he was leaving and was uh, at the Rijksmuseum where you can rent it out and dine in front of the night watchman. And that was quite cool, although I was a bit sick that night, so I couldn't have any of the posh wine. I could only just, damn, almost had it, almost had it. And uh, the ambassador, he had a, an awards kind of ceremony during the dinner, and myself and a few other people uh, were given uh, various uh, gifts and so forth at the Rijksmuseum, so it was quite an awesome evening, I must say. And uh, yeah, I got to schmooze, even though I was sick, uh, with a bunch of dignitaries and uh, pretend to almost drink wine, so that was kind of cool. And there were a few lessons that I learned from this, and one of them is when you've got an incident, you might think it could be basic, but sometimes it can actually be intertwined in geopolitics, and you have to look at the entire picture, Uh, especially if you work for certain types of organizations or if you happen to be a pivot into certain organizations and you're not aware of it. Uh, think about accounting software in the Ukraine is a good example. Uh, another one is when you've got a major incident and it involves a, a terrorist group or cyber terrorist group or someone insane uh, or a group that isn't very nice, uh, it can actually result in real human consequences and real people can be affected, uh, safety, life, and limb. And be aware that uh, incidents can have a major impact on people like that. Uh, another one is, if you ever get gifts from a foreign government, always have them checked. That's always a good idea. You never know. Uh, after they checked out my prayer beads and they uh, said nothing was in them, I actually still have them at home. And they gave them back. So that was kind of cool. So I keep them as a, uh, a souvenir to remind me of uh, my, my Turkish intel friends. Uh, another thing is, uh, depending on your um, role in an organization, you can be placed at high risk. And it's always a good idea to try to uh, sit your closest family down and describe it because they are what we call the closest hop. And sometimes uh, a naughty person can use your closest hop to get to you. And uh, because of my military background, I'm not used to discussing these types of things with anyone close to me. And it was a very strange conversation when two years later, I told my then partner that uh, this had been going on and he had had no idea. We'll say it was a discussion with some raised voices. But anyway, uh, try to make them aware because uh, they could also be targeted to get to you. And uh, last but not least, when you find yourself in a situation that can be quite dangerous, always try to stay calm because if you don't, especially when you're involved in an incident and you're an incident manager, you're the one person that is trying to calm all the chaos. The managers are going to be screaming because they like to scream. Um, but you have to calm people down, calm that chaos. If you don't, then it will get way more chaotic. And if you're facing a situation like this, it could actually cost lives, including your own. So try to take a deep breath. Think about the OWASP top 10, right? And then it's all good. So I did try to leave time for questions, and I noticed there's a whole bunch of people. Uh, Martin has a microphone, so start raising your hands, and uh, thank you very much, everybody. Any questions? Got to be a few. Come up to me. I don't have to run all the way. I'm not 20 anymore. All right. Uh, so in the context of the car bomb, you were mentioning that modern questions require modern solutions. I wanted to know what exactly you find modern about that. Well, <laughs> um, I, sometimes you, you, people have to be reassigned in situations where they can basically be neutralized. And that was what had to occur. Um, so modern problems require modern solutions, yes. More questions? Okay, uh, you will stay with us the whole day, I think. Yep. <laughs>
Yeah. I'll be around the whole day. Okay. Uh, as you might have noticed, all the talks, the keynotes, and the speaker sessions, except the uh, uh, All Stars, are recorded and will be online. So everything you miss, you will find as soon possible back online, and also the slides will be collected. So thanks again, for Chris.